Okay, we're recording. Hey, Melissa, how are you? I'm doing well, Sally. How are you? Awesome. Now, do you go by Melissa Del Toro Schaffner, or do you do Melissa Del Toro, or what, what's, the, what's the deal these days? Okay, so, well, I started my business when I was dating my husband, so, or actually, let's see, we were just newly married, so, you know, kind of like in that in that part right do i want to join my business to my relationship and use my married name mm -hmm. or do i want to just be my own brand like i have been for 30 some odd years so i just chose to leave the relation my relationship name out of my brand and so i'm just melissa del toro international and okay so, and so melissa del toro is fine but on facebook i'm melissa del toro schaffner it kind of gives me another level of privacy so i kind of at like one point you had two facebook profiles. Do yeah. I, I learned actually that that's like not a thing. I was taught in a program I was in that that was the thing to do. So I did that to try and keep business and personal separate because I wanted my friends to have my personal and then I wanted to build my business on a separate one. And then I was told as Facebook was evolving, because this was about, you know, four or five years ago. Five years, yeah. Yeah, as Facebook was evolving and the security measures and everything, I was told by some experts, and I know you're an expert on it, that that was not a thing that you should do. So I have been phasing out, trying to pull all my contacts away from that into my personal, and then changing the relationship of the people who who I friend. Right, like, right, because you have different options now, and yeah. I just, I just don't really like to mix. The, I know a lot of people mix personal and, and business, but these days with the environment of, you know, with women, with children, with politics, it's just really, um, it's just really not smart to air some, some of your dirty laundry with your personal life into your business because it just makes it a little messy and can turn off some of your clients. So. That's true. That's true. I even got in trouble for uh, a blog post I wrote where I used a, a, a bad word and I and I was going to be <laughs> I was going to be evaluated to exhibit at this event here in Nashville and I was asked to tone it down and maybe abbreviate it and so I did but uh, it was kind of funny because I was like oh okay at first I was like no and then I was like no it's okay I live in the south I'm in the Bible Belt I kind of need to adhere to some of the things going on and I'm trying my best to be more local because I feel like nobody in town knows who I am yet I've got a presence all over the world but locally I my presence is like this you know right Right, right. Well, let me, let me introduce myself to your listeners, because so, I'm yes. so excited to be here today, and they're probably like, who is, the, who is this chick? Who is this lady? I take my time, another, another five minutes of my time to listen to this. So uh, my name is Melissa Del Toro Schaffner. Uh, I do go by Melissa Del Toro for my business, and I'm a voiceover artist. So I help um, clients bring life and, and uh, create a warm relationship with their audience. I have a friendly sort of conversational, warm maternal tone. So I like to um, uh, book scripts that, that can use that to their advantage to create a relationship with their customers. So that's what I do. No way. I didn't even know that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we have been talking because I have pivoted. So, so why should you even listen for another second well my story is super interesting and i think that uh, all your listeners would probably really be able to identify with pieces because i started out you know a young puerto rican girl in pittsburgh pennsylvania in a jewish neighborhood that's where my roots are okay um, so i grew up uh, uh in pittsburgh pennsylvania i went to penn state for electrical engineering i graduated with my electrical engineering degree i got my mba in seattle so i moved across the country and lived in seattle for 10 years which was amazing and then i didn't want any more rain and i was kind of in my mid-30s looking for you know my my uh, my forever love <laughs> and, I was, and I was emerging from some really toxic relationships and a lot of self-loathing and a lot of daddy issues and stuff like that so I moved to Austin Texas because I heard it was amazing it was I lived there for two years and met my husband who is in, uh, coincidentally from LA so, I mean <laughs> he's not a cowboy <laughs> right right He's not a Southern gentleman. He's not a cowboy, but he is a gentleman. And um, we moved to New York City. So um, a lot of people who, who know me, know me 
mostly from my work in New York City because that's where I started my business four years ago. I had my daughter there. Um, I was married while I was there. Um, and it was just in a really incredible journey. So I met Sally um, in New York City. Of, yes. all the, <laughs> of all the places in the universe that I've been, I've been there, found myself um, at a conference. And we're also both part of Project Positive Change, which is an amazing organization that I think every, every person who wants to change the world for good should be part of that organization. So you can ask Sally. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I'm an engineer and converted to, an, uh, to a voiceover artist. So you really couldn't <laughs> be too different. <laughs> so when I first met you, what made me notice you, we were in that conference of Kim Luna's in New York City. And she was doing, she had you get in the hot seat at the yeah. room and asked you some questions and you explained that you had just come from engineering, you had quit your job and you were trying to appeal with soft skills to the engineering uh, people so that they would be able to, you know, get through their work yes. uh, better, they could have better relationships at work, they could have, you know, better communication, whatever it was. And I was intrigued by you because I came from you know an actuarial background which is also a very scientific field very math oriented field and I was like huh that's really interesting what she's doing and here I am trying to do some sort of creative marketing advertising career on my own and so I ended up talking to you I don't know if I would just walked up to you and said hello or if we met at the dinner that night or how we ended up meeting but we ended up hitting it off. And then it was so funny how the next time I ran into you, you were a member of Project Positive Change, which was something yeah. I had And that was totally another coincidence. Yeah. And the thing, when I was back in New York for something else, I was like, come meet me. And we met in the park with your, yeah. and your daughter. And yeah. you had not even had your daughter yet. So I watched you throughout your whole pregnancy and everything building your business and making all these changes and then I also remember which was very profound to me was that coloring book that you were working on do you still have that is that I out do. there I do so that coloring book um, was the brainchild of mine and my mother's it's a, a multicultural coloring book it's called mm -hmm. careers for little sisters and it was a brainchild of my mother's and mine because as I was growing this little person I didn't know if it was a girl or a boy at the time as I was growing this little person in, in, in my belly I'm thinking you know when she comes out what is she you know what kinds of materials are what kinds of materials are out there to help her inspire her to show her what she can do in the world? Because, you know, from a Puerto Rican background, uh, you know, a lot of the books you look at, there's not a lot of like little Latin girls and stuff like that. Since then, like four or five years ago, there are a lot of materials. Lot of right? Mm -hmm. But when, when I created the coloring book, I actually had to teach myself how to draw on the tablet. I had a belly this big and I was just trying to hurry up and finish it and publish it before she was born. <laughs> and I was like, we got to get this thing done because once she's here, that's it. <laughs> like, no time, no time yeah. after that. Exactly. So it was really great. I took it around to the New York City school system and I used it as a tool to talk to children, specifically second graders, because second grade, age 10 is a magical time because kids still know who they are. They haven't been sort of poisoned by society to tell them right. who they are. Right. So they're, they're amazing. So I was going to second graders and you know, telling them to dream big. What is it you wanna do? You know yourself the best that you'll ever know yourself. You know, in your whole life, people go to therapy to remember what you know right now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so exactly. like, so just, and not be messed up by this whole what limiting beliefs and things that happened to you as a child and if you had if this hadn't happened maybe you wouldn't think this way and you're not and you're 35 years old trying to figure out why you think this way and you're rolling back to all these memories of that time so it's very yeah. It's powerful and, and what I loved is that the book focuses on a lot of different uh I wanted the book to have um characters in it that looked like real people so a lot of the inspiration I got from how I drew I drew the book and I wrote it so I did everything in it and I published it on what used to be create space it's now Kindle Direct um, is people on the subway 
like as I was going back and forth to doctor's appointments in and out of Manhattan, I was like sort of stalking people and like memorizing their hair and memorizing their body and memorizing their shoes. And then I yeah, because you wouldn't dare take a picture. They might get up and beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've almost beat up people for taking my picture, but that's different. <laughs> there you go. So, so yeah, so it did really well. I was promoting it in the schools. I was promoting it on Instagram. It's still out there, but I've taken the focus off of it. Um, it was generating some pretty decent revenue for a minute. Um, uh -huh. it was really, really exciting. Um, creating a product is a really great way to have an additional uh, revenue income stream in your life. So if people who are listening think about other products you can create from the things you know, and I'm sure Sally can you know, teach you about Well, I would love, if you do still have a link for that, I would love to attach it to um, my ads and things when I do my ads to get people to watch this live or to listen to the podcast or however we form yeah. this. I haven't even decided how I'm going to move. <laughs> cool. I am wanting to start a podcast and I've got tons and tons of interviews set up with some really interesting people who happen to have this sort of, you know, finance or engineering or sort of background and our logical science background but they're moving into these creative spaces or they're using something creative to really bring forth the learning from the logical side of things that they're doing so, um, it's been really fun I tend to attract those people in my life yes. I how it just seems to be this magic thing that happens and so that's sort of the direction I'm going so I'd love to be able to pull that back out of you if you're okay with that. I would, I would love that. You know, I think I'm thinking of something interesting. Like if I was with you and, and all, you know, the, the 10, the hundred thousand people that are going to be listening to this episode. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> million, million, millions. If I was with you in, in a coffee shop and I'm thinking that probably one of the things that you would be wondering is like, how, how did you go from doing engineering to like voice acting? Like what, who does yeah. that? Who makes that jump? So, so if I have your permission, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey, like in 500 words or less. Yes, because the next piece where we met up again was through project management. And yeah. I didn't realize you were doing that, but yeah. just, just a conversation sort of turned into it. And then you helped me at the time. Of course, I wasn't completely ready for it, which yep. I now but I wasn't ready for it then but it's it's interesting so yes please go through that journey of how you've changed and grown and what we would what'd you call it the extemporaneous journey <laughs> I was in Toastmasters and anybody who's listening that did Toastmasters knows about extemporaneous speaking it's basically when they just put you there and say and go go <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you've been booked for a meeting like hey you have a meeting to lead in five minutes did you, you know and you're just like oh Great. What are, what am I supposed to be talking about? You know, that's how I teach. Yeah. I come up with a topic cause I'm, cause people are talking about it in my group and I'm like, ah, oh, why don't we teach that in the next session? And then at like literally an hour before I go, what am I teaching today? And then <laughs> I get in there and just talk about it. And it just, it works out every time. That's awesome. I, I really believe like we had talked about before that whatever, you need to hear you're going to hear it today because you're tuned in yeah so whatever it is that made you keep listening to this point you're going to find out the answer you know you're going to hear your answer and you're going to be a better person for it so uh, i love sharing sharing my experiences and my voice to try and help people to refine their journey so so we had talked about before that I went to Penn State for electrical engineering and sort that's where the story starts um i have always been sort of daddy's girl and my father was an electrical engineer by training, but he never fulfilled that uh, training. He actually went to work for the IRS and he was very sad most of his life. He didn't like, he didn't like what he had to do for his job. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a whole nother discussion about what that did to my psyche about how I feel about work. But um, I, cho I chose, I had two choices. My mother was a teacher. My father was an electrical engineer. I chose not to go broke like 
most artists do. And I said, I'm not going to do something, you know, creative and teaching because I want to make money. You know, I want to make a lot of money. So I'm going to be an engineer. So I went to school for engineering. I got my MBA. I kept piling the degrees on top of it. I got my project management master certificate. You know, while I was single, I thought, I'm just going to get all the education I, I want because once I have a family, I'm never learning another thing again. <laughs> <laughs> Funny but, how that happens. Yeah, funny how that happens. So, and it's um, so not, not, true. <laughs> so not true. And then, so I'm in my 30s. I, I you know, I, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I was in the construction industry for 20, almost 20 years as an electrical engineer and project manager. So that's what I did for my bread and butter. It's a really good paying career, but you travel a lot and you're pretty much married to a career like that. So there really wasn't a whole lot of room for me to have love in my life and to have children. It's just, you know, you're really dedicated to your work at that point, or at least that was my mindset. So, um, so I got all those degrees and everything. I'm in my mid thirties and I'm just emerging out of a toxic relationship with a person that was very, very unkind, a very unkind person. And I realized that, you know, like life is too short. You, ha you have to, you have to travel. You have to do all the wonderful things. So I quit my job in Seattle. I traveled all over Europe for four months by myself and I got my head back in the game moved in with my parents <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah i was about to say here where's home <laughs> at the tender age of 35 and then from my parents home sort of getting my head around it i moved to austin texas i worked in the renewable energy field um uh, wind and solar farms i had a project i did in hawaii and that's i met my husband in that job and my husband works in film and television so all the you know all of the things rotating around each other my husband gets called to new york city so i essentially book him a ticket on a plane i'm like you're going to new york city and i'm just dating him at this point you know who am but, i but i was like i love him i want to be with him and i don't want to be dating this dude at my company like i want to be with him so like, go to new york city <laughs> So, so he went and it was wonderful and he really found a home in the film scene there. So I moved up with him and we were there for five years. And like I said, we had our, we broke up while we were there. We got together while we were there. We got married. Um, I started my business about a month before I found out I was pregnant. So what happened was I had a Jerry Maguire moment at the company that I was working at at Manhattan. The um, lead engineer was very unkind. He said a lot of really unkind things to me. And I basically left the building crying uh, because I had to visit my dad in Texas or in Arizona, who was very, very sick. He had Parkinson's. And this guy basically accused me that I always drop the ball, that I never do my work, all this kind of terrible things that were not true. And I think it was because he was very unhappy. But when I came back to New York City after seeing my father, who was very ill, I thought, I can't work here anymore. In fact, I can't even do this anymore. Like, it's stressing me out so bad. And we were having trouble getting pregnant. I said, I'm, I'm done with this. And I quit. And within like weeks, I was able to get pregnant because the stress, just yeah. started, my body just opened was gone. Up. It was gone. So that was wonderful. I had a great pregnancy and all that kind of thing, but I was also beginning to build my business. And what I knew was engineering. I knew project management. And that's where you had said where you had met me that I was building the soft skills for engineers. I realized that young engineers think they know everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so trying to sell something to people who know everything is very challenging. <laughs> so yes. yeah so um i pivoted a little bit which a lot of people do in their business a lot i mean you just have to be in motion that's one of the things i learned from kimra is you just have to be in motion and then you learn who you're connecting with what you like to do what you're good at people will tell you what you're good at yeah you know, they'll tell you how they'll they respond. Yeah. They'll respond yeah. to you and however it is. Whenever I talked about my mother when she was dying, people responded unbelievably to the emotion that I was able to convey in my writing. Yeah. And so that definitely helped me change a lot of the things that I've been doing. So I know that that's true. Yeah. 
back yeah. to you pivoting at that point, then you were pregnant. And so then you went into the book, the coloring book. And then what else? And then, so I went into the coloring book because it was sort of like, I can't do the engineering thing, but I really want to get this coloring book out there. And so I started going around to schools. Some schools actually paid me to do speaking gigs with, to their students, which was really cool. Um, and I um, went around to the schools talking about my coloring book. And then I started to discover the project management skill set that was useful. I was, I was getting called upon to help business owners get organized. Mm -hmm. So for the next maybe two years, I did project management gigs where I would book clients, I would give them solely my time, I would go into their business, I would identify what was sort of like going awry, what was good, and we'd make plans and then I'd help people stick to them with that accountability that every business owner needs. Mm -hmm. um, and it was working out really, really great for a really long time. And my daughter was on my lap nursing, you know, breastfeeding while I was working and I was on web webinars and it was perfect until my daughter started talking. <laughs> and yeah. then everything went, um, and I couldn't, you. I couldn't even hear myself on the phone anymore because my Every time I would get on the phone with a client, my daughter would want to talk, um, which was wonderful for me because I knew I had a smart baby, but not good for clients. So um, the client that I had, I had told you the story, the client that I had at the time felt that um, the amount that she was paying me as a freelancer and uh, the amount of work she needed me to do in my schedule, they all just didn't match. I just couldn't sit behind the computer eight hours a day for her, waiting mm -hmm. for her client collateral to come in reviewing it against what they sent the last time to make sure it was all correct i couldn't yeah you just couldn't concentrate on that not when you have a running around so i knew i needed a new business model but i didn't know what and i knew that i wanted to really go in a direction of being more creative but i didn't know how so after i dropped the project management i did some vision board workshops for a while because they allowed me to have an event and to create some income in a, like a one day event and then have the rest of the time very flexible for me to plan. Were you still in New York at this time or had you moved to Arizona? I had, I moved to Arizona during my assignment with that project management client and, okay. she, and she experienced the blip of me moving here and she decided that she didn't want that dynamic in her business right so that's so then that's when I abandoned the project management work and I went into some vision board work which was great but I found that um, people in bigger cities tend to dream bigger than people in smaller cities and that's just a fact uh, people who are in smaller cities like to be with their family they maybe the biggest dream is to get a house or an RV and travel a little bit, you know, in the country. But right. as far as paying for vision board workshops, it wasn't lucrative enough to pay my monthly bills. So I'm going, huh, geez, now what? <laughs> well, now what do you do? <laughs> now what do I do? Here's this electrical engineer MBA with my project management masters, and I can't even make, I can't make two pennies to rub together. Yeah. I can't even, I can't figure it out. And part of that was because that was around the time my father was dying. Oh, sorry. So that was around the time was my dad was dying. Um, and he, he died nine months after we moved here. So it was perfect. We were supposed to be here. I was supposed to be available. I didn't have any work. So I could just go to my dad. I could help my mom. It was mm -hmm. perfect, perfect, perfect. Perfect. I mean, of course, my credit cards and stuff didn't think it was perfect. <laughs> well, and at the time when you're living it, you don't really have the same perspective. No, no. You don't I mean, know what's happening. When I was living it, I just thought, I, there's something wrong with me because I am so highly accomplished. And I was making, you know, so much money in New York City. And, and then to go into a situation where I can't even sell. I can't even sell anything. <laughs> and I realized I was just really grieving. And that, you know, that was probably about two years ago now. Mm -hmm. One and, yeah, about two years ago now. So vision boards, 
not working out so well. So I decided at that point, which is what you wanted me to tell your listeners, this is the big juicy part that you can squeeze from the story. Is I figured if I'm not going to make money doing what I hate, <laughs> I might as well not do- make money doing what I love. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. So I looked at my vision board, which is literally right here. And if you're listening to a podcast, you can't see that I've pulled out this giant board of dreams. But if you're watching the the, fil- the video, you can. Yeah. And I realized that on my vision board, I have this. Well, besides this naked butt, there's a naked butt on there, but there is <laughs> a, a, microphone a microphone symbolizing my voiceover dreams. And I've had that on there for like 20 years. I was talking about it, you know, 20 years ago. And so I said, it's time. I'm 45. I'm the mother of a three-year-old. I have a lot left in me. Let's do this thing. So as of January this year, I dedicated myself to voiceover. And for anybody listening that doesn't know what that is, basically, if you hear a voice and you don't see a body it's coming out of, that's voiceover. That's voiceover. Right? So you hear it everywhere. The New York City subway, you hear it. You hear it in elevators. You hear it um, when you're watching a video and there's somebody talking, but you don't see that person. Mm Mm-hmm. Those are on TV commercials, you'll all kinds of things, everything, radio, everything that you hear a voice, toys, video games. I mean, the field is so huge. Even Alexa is a voiceover, Mm -hmm. you know? So I decided this has been my passion forever is to connect with people using my voice, you know? So as of January, I began integrating on LinkedIn and Facebook with the, with the acting community, with the voiceover actor community. They absorbed me like the biggest sponge and just, and I just knew I was home. I was like, wow, why didn't I just, you know, <laughs> why, why would you even find people? What did you, what do you do? Did you just change your title and just start going for it? Or did you, do, how do you, are you signed up on the Amazon voiceover thing that they have for reading books or, I mean, what did you do? So January 1st, I said, I'm going to get into voiceovers. Now, the background is, is that I had already taken classes many moons ago at the University of Washington and in New York City with Roger Becker. I had taken voiceover classes, so I knew that I liked it. If anybody's listening that they think that's intriguing, take a few classes because you either love it or you hate it. Mm -hmm. Because it is acting, after all. It's performing. And it's emoting. (laughs) And... Um, I had taken classes and I knew I loved it. I already had all the equipment and I went on to Audible to ACX because I had produced the coloring book. So I thought, okay, well, they also produce audio books. So I I auditioned for an audio book and I got one and it's actually now for sale. I'm going to be promoting it pretty soon. Yay! Yay. (laughs) First audio book. (laughs) My baby. My baby. Yay. Yeah, so I produced an audiobook on ACX, which is one way you can use your voice. It's long form narration, which is a little bit different than commercials and sort of short flips and bursts. Right. Um, so I did that. And basically, what I've been doing is just um, engaging business owners who need um, tutorial video, you know, e learning tutorial videos they need a a voice or they explainer videos or like if you want a promotional video for your business talking about what you do you know things like that um i can you know i work with video producers or i just produce the audio on my own again audiobooks um i do dive into you know auditioning for commercials and things like that but i feel like i have some more classes to take before i'm really ready to perform on demand okay so so that's kind of where i'm at huh what about spanish okay so anytime you switch any part of voiceover whether you're going from commercials to audiobooks or if you're going from one language to another you need to actually take courses to learn how to do that because for instance spanish voiceover in latin america is very different than Spanish voiceover here in the United States. They have a different way that they communicate. Uh, like here, if you've ever heard, you know, the commercials on Mexican radio is like, you know, oh, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> ah, oh, hey. 
you know, you kind of have that feeling. Whereas <laughs> <laughs> in some other countries, you have the yeah. Oh, you know, like that kind of feeling. It's a different bird call, like a song almost. So yeah. whenever you're auditioning for these different spots, you have to know who's the audience, you know, what they're intending to communicate, how to perform and inflect your voice so that it's appropriate and it um, engages the audience. You know, you can hear when somebody's reading something to you and then you can hear when they're actually saying it to you like we're talking right now. Yeah, yeah. I had to do a voiceover in Spanish for a corporate website wow. for healthcare. Wow. They called, this friend of mine was working for the company, doing their website, and she said, Sally knows how to speak Spanish, and they already had the words, they had it already translated, I just had to read it, nice. and it took me a little while to get back into the rhythm of it, but honestly, I don't know if my inflection was really right when it came to communication within the Spanish language, but it was such a corporate -y kind of a thing that it really didn't matter that I was reading <laughs> just doing the best that I could with it. It didn't pay that much either. And I think I never even got my final payment on it, but what regardless it was, it was very interesting. And so for you to bring that up about to, how to speak to people and where they are and to really know your audience, it, that's really interesting to me. I'd never even thought of it that way. It's funny because when I was in college, um, I was working for a company called Amp Incorporated, which it got bought out by Tyco Electronics. And there was this big thing with the, with the dude the, with the $200 shower curtain. It was like this big scandal back in the 90s. And um, somebody was, had a connection in Mexico and they needed um, signs for a machine. You know, when you push the buttons on, on uh, machines in the factory, like stop, forward. Yeah. They just needed some button translations. So I said, yeah. oh, I Spanish, I can totally do button translations. So I put the spreadsheet together at my tender age of like 19 years old and I was really open and excited and, and, and so thrilled to share my Spanish. And then I found out that they couldn't use what I made and that everybody in the factory was laughing at my translations when they got them because I was using literal translations yeah. for words instead of like the word that they would use. So they were howling and laughing so hard and I was so humiliated. It was like, it was like almost as if your toddler just went, <laughs> they were just like, what is this translation? So stupid. Yeah. So, um, so the colloquialisms and all of the normal things that they say on a daily basis were out the window. This was all about your... They say stop. They don't say, they don't say para or para or, or whatever you say. They say stop. Para, yeah. yeah. They say so, stop. So I'm putting all these like, you know, formal words on it because I didn't actually know what they were using it for. And I had never been to a factory in Mexico. So I didn't know, you know, and, and these tiny things, what you don't know that you don't know is actually what bites you. That's what you pay for when you have training and experience, when you have trained people, that's what you're paying for. So you don't get bitten in that way because that costs time and money to get bitten in that way. Yeah, well, and it goes to show, here's a corporation thinking they need to go hire someone who speaks Spanish, when really, they probably could have had a group meeting with some of their employees and had this discussion around what was needed and could have done it much better and for nothing. Yeah. Extra. So, I mean, so there you go. So there you go. But so that's kind of the, 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 the connection of the engineering to the voice voice acting and really i mean i've been doing it all my life the best the thing that i knew how to do best when i was younger is play barbies i mean i played barbies for like 15 years it was ridiculous <laughs> and my sisters would literally sit behind me while i was playing barbies and watch me like like watching tv or a movie like it was that dramatic you know how i performed with my barbies <laughs> that's pretty funny well, so now what are your main, do you have like a website? Are you trying to figure out some sort of program? 
or are you just looking for opportunities in every corner for voice? Well, you know, I took a lot of courses when I was in New York City this past month. I was there for a whole month. And um, basically one of the best pieces of advice that I got while I was there from somebody who's actually making money <laughs> is don't throw out every skill set that I have is going to be important to somebody. So don't, just because I've done project management and I won't, not promoting it anymore, doesn't mean that if I get in the door with somebody that, that I shouldn't, you know, um, promote you, those skills. Yeah, yeah right. put it on your list of skills, use it in, well, you could probably easily use it on helping, you could even help people with vo finding voiceover things and, I mean, Absolutely kinds of things that you could do with your project management skills in this industry. Just setting up your business, just setting up your Google Drive with, with the folders that you need to put your auditions in, to put, to put your, we generate very big files in this industry. Anybody who does video and audio generates very big files and you can't keep yeah. it locally on your hard drive. So just, you know, having an organization structure for that, um, just doing technical things, creative people who perform or tech, usually very techno uh, technophobic so i'm not you do so have to easily stay on track with all your voiceover you know all of your whatever i don't know what what you call it but you could easily teach something like that in a course to your peers and also be doing the voiceover work yourself and showing them what you're doing and how you're managing all of that and getting a google account for unlimited data is only like 10 bucks a month yeah, and I mean actors. Let's face it. I mean, I'm pro I was probably making as much as an actor when I was when I wasn't. I mean, actors just they they do a lot of work for for not a lot of money until they get you know uh, more seasoned in their own marketing. So there's on camera types of stuff that you can do. There's national commercials that pay residuals. There's audio books which are not very high paying, but what as they stay out there and as the book gains popularity kind of like exponential mm. and you know there's so many things that that we can do but we have to be our own business owner we have we can't rely on other people to get us work I have a website melissadeltoro.com and it has samples of my voice mm -hmm. and also description of my equipment that I have in my home studio I have a professional home studio that I built here um, that I record out of so I'm in Arizona and I record out of my home studio nice yeah, so, so I mean, you know, there's, there's always a chance to reinvent yourself, and there's always a chance to go for what you want. You're never too old. You've never done too much or too little. Just whatever it is you want to do, start today. Get clear on what you want to accomplish, because that's how I've done everything. I wasn't smart enough for electrical engineering. I just decided that's what I was going to do, and I did it. Mm -hmm. you know, I was terrible at math as a child. I was terrible at math as a child, like the worst. No. <laughs> I was the worst at math. And then here's me doing the calculations for 42 story buildings in Manhattan, in Manhattan. You know, like I, the way that I figured it is math is a language, just like Spanish or French or Russian, which I took five years of. You just figure, you figure it out and you just do it. Like, that's how you get past your fear in anything. That's how I got past my fear of having a child, of getting married, of moving across the country. You just do it, you know? I love that. Well, I need to wrap this up because we're running out of time, but you did mention that melissadeltoro.com is where you could go if somebody wanted to see uh, what you've got on your website there. It's one, one L, two, uh, one S L, one R. M-E-L-I-S-S-A-D-E-L-T-O-R-O.com. Okay, and I'll put that in the notes. Pardon? <laughs> Just like Benicio. I think but he's related to me, by the way. Oh, that would be great. By like a, like a cousin, like a, like a fifth cousin or something like that. <laughs> oh, we need to find a way to, to get a message out to him. <laughs> to leverage that, hey, help, help out a family member. You know. Exactly. So I love that you've done this in your journey and I have a feeling that we have to talk again because I really want to dig into your traveling that you did for several months after how many, how long did you travel? So Seattle. So after I left Seattle, I went, I went um, to London for a month and lived with my sister. She's married to a British uh, gentleman. And okay. then I traveled to Scotland, 
to Spain, to Tenerife, which is in the Canary Islands. Um, where else did I go? Scotland? Yeah. Next time we talk, let's dig into that trip because I want to know. I've got a lot of travels myself, and I want to be able to compare notes and see what you what you've done. I've got a lot of great tips as far as like how to do it on the on the cheap too, and how to get yeah. resourceful. How to get resourceful too. Which when you get older, though, you don't want to do it as much on the cheap. I mean, you want it to be cheaper, but you get to the point too where you're not necessarily apt to do the same type of travel when you, you climb a lot of stairs when you do it on the cheap let's just put it that way <laughs> yeah you do climb a lot of stairs you also share a lot of bathrooms you pay money to take a shower <laughs> <laughs> i think everyone should travel that would be a great episode everyone should travel it makes you smarter it makes you more compassionate it makes you just a better world citizen everyone should travel awesome well thank you so much and i can't wait to talk to you next time Yay. Talk to you later, Sally. Thank you for okay. having me. Bye, everyone. Bye.